such wonderful memories of my time at Yale as an RWJ clinical scholar. I'm so, so very grateful for the lifelong friendships and uh, the incredible support of so many amazing mentors that I had at Yale, especially Dr. Harlan Krumholtz and Dr. Kerry Gross and so many others. And I say this because I really believe that the lessons I learned during my time at Yale were the foundation for my work uh, throughout my career with veterans and with Medicaid patients around improving access to care, around equity, and, and uh, uh, getting better outcomes for health care. Um, during my time at Yale, I learned three key lessons uh, from my mentors and my colleagues. First, the power of collaboration. Second, the importance of flexibility. And third, the duty to remember those who don't have a seat at the table, those who are vulnerable, those who are underprivileged, those who um, are underserved. And these principles of collaboration, of flexibility, and focusing on disparities drove my work after I left Yale. Well, I served first as Chief Medical Officer for Louisiana Medicaid, and later as Deputy Undersecretary for Health for Community Care at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and as Special Advisor to the Secretary of the VA. I really believe that these uh, principles enabled our success in so many of our initiatives that we achieved, such as achieving a 40% reduction in opioid prescriptions statewide, enabling low-income women with breast cancer, uh, the ability to gain coverage for the first time to needed reconstructive uh, breast surgery and access to BRCA testing, uh, developing a Zika prevention strategy for pregnant Medicaid women, and Something I'm really proud of it, though, is the uh, employee engagement uh, work and frontline supervisor training that has seen our VA system rise from being ranked in 2017 the second worst uh, place to work to in 2018 becoming the sixth best place to work. And, and that has continued. And now in 2020, uh, our VA system is ranked um, by Forbes as one of the best employers. So really, really proud of it. And I really believe that all of this has been possible because of collaboration, because of flexibility, and always, always remembering those who don't have a seat at the table. And I think that these three lessons are even more true during the COVID-19 pandemic. I've seen the, the critical importance of flexibility. Last year, I had been working with the Aspen Institute uh, Health Innovators Program to develop and launch leadership toolkits to, uh, to assist in a series of healthcare crises. And these were tools that were supposed to help leaders rapidly assess their organization's preparedness for the crisis, identify the organization's areas of weakness, and strategically target resources for the greatest impact. And this was meant to help hospitals dealing with it, things such as an upsurge in medical errors or preparing for a natural disaster like a hurricane or a flood or responding to, to a mass shooting. However, when we first started hearing about the no novel coronavirus abroad, I realized it was just a matter of time and a plane ride away before this outbreak jumped continents and became a global pandemic. And so I pivoted to quickly adapting this work that we were already doing to instead helping organizations and communities rapidly assess their COVID-19 preparedness. So we developed an online tool that could be deployed across an entire organization or a community from uh, frontline workers to senior executives to help that organization and its leaders quickly assess their preparedness, uh, identify their areas of weakness for future strategic targeting. And after I developed this COVID-19 preparedness tool, I needed a way to rapidly uh, disseminate it widely. And I wanted to make sure that it was available free to anyone who needed to use it. So I put out a bat signal call out to my colleagues and the help just came pouring in from everywhere. My classmate, uh, Michael O'Neill, distributed the COVID-19 preparedness tool um, and he made it available online and free to a national network of hospitals and clinics through his organization, Get Well Network. 
My colleagues from the Presidential Leadership Scholars Alumni Network shared it with their um, nonprofits in their communities and corporations in their network. And, and so none of that would have been possible without the collaboration of all, so many people. But I've also seen the power of collaboration during this pandemic in really novel ways. Um, as COVID-19 started exploding across hot spots in the country, collaboration began spontaneously through social media. And for example, through WhatsApp group chats and uh, Google Docs sharing, I worked with a community of physician leaders. Uh, they were from across the board, doctors tackling COVID-19 in rural Texas, um, uh, doctors caring for patients in hard hit Los Angeles, professors at uh, Johns Hopkins and Emory and Baylor. And many of them were my colleagues from the President Leadership Scholars, from RWJ, from uh, Aspen, from from all sorts of different networks and just coming together through social media. And together, we pooled our expertise and our experiences from the front lines because in a essence, we were, we were building a plane as we're trying to learn how to fly it. And, and using our experiences, we compiled a, a, a set of best practices for hospitals taking care of COVID-19 patients. And I've never even seen or met many of these doctors that I worked with, but this collaboration birthed from social media was uh, shared by the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst as a free resource to help hospitals across the country implement strategies that would mitigate transmission of COVID, that would conserve resources, and that would support healthcare providers during the pandemic. And together through, through these WhatsApp group chats and Google Docs sharing, we've, we've compiled about half a dozen different uh, COVID-19 resources available to the public free through journals and blogs and websites. But I also wanted to uh, put the spotlight on some of my uh, these phenomenal frontline physicians who are doing, in particular, work to address disparities across uh, the country and exposed by the pandemic. For example, my friend, Dr. Michael Hull, is a pediatrician working with Good Apple. This is a grocery delivery service that's fighting food insecurity. And during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Good Apple launched the Stay Home, Stay Healthy initiative to help older adults and people with weak immune systems stay at home as they have uh, healthy food delivered to their food uh, doorsteps. And during this pandemic, Good Apple has delivered 550,000 pounds of food to about 18,000 people. And I also wanted to highlight the work of my friend, Margaret Lapiz. Uh, she's an Aspen Institute health innovator who's working with the Latinx community in the Pajaro Valley in Watsonville. Um, many of these uh, are agricultural farm workers doing the essential work that produces much of the berries and fruits that are eaten in the US. And the Latinx community comprises about 30% of this community, but suffers about 60% of the, of the caseload um, in, in the community. And uh, Margaret, through working in a community participatory manner with community-led initiatives, they're able to dramatically decrease new cases and um, their strategies are now being implemented by other counties and other cities across the country to help vulnerable populations prevent transmission of COVID-19. This is just a few of the examples of the incredible work some of my colleagues are doing tirelessly to tackle the disparities seen during this pandemic. COVID-19 has exposed a dark underbelly of inequity, of insecurity, and vulnerabilities. And these disparities are immense. But as you've seen, when people of conscience come together, there is a lot of shared strength um, and a lot of shared wisdom. And this gives me hope. And I'm so grateful for the lessons I've learned over the years at Yale about collaboration and flexibility and, and focusing, the, the critical need to focus on the vulnerable. But I think I would really want to close by saying that the greatest lesson that I learned from my mentors at Yale and my colleagues is to have the courage to face challenges head on. And so I would say to the future women of Yale and, and to all the women out there to, to have hope and to have courage. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. 
It's great to be here. I so appreciate being part of this amazing event. When I was an undergrad at Yale, I became a tour guide to try to overcome my fear of public speaking. And I ended every tour at the Yale Women's Table. So I had a regular reminder of everyone who went before who paved the way so that I could be there without question. Today, I wanted to address some of the inequities that have played out in, in COVID. While I could talk about this for hours, I thought in 10 minutes, speaking fairly fast, I could bring up four main points. The first one is that health inequities are the defining feature of coronavirus pandemic. We are used to thinking of health inequities as one component of a larger health problem or disease, but in this case, health inequities are the problem. Black Americans make up 12% of our population, but 19% of cases and 20% of deaths from COVID. Hispanic or Latino Americans make up 18% of the population, but 29% of cases and 21% of, of deaths from COVID. The APM Research Lab has been analyzing death rates by race and ethnicity since the beginning of this pandemic. They found that one in 2,100 white Americans has died from COVID, one in 2,400 Asian Americans has died from COVID. Those are tragic numbers by any measure, but the number among Latino Americans is one in 1,500. Among Pacific Islander Americans, it's one in 1,400. Among indigenous Americans, it's one in 1,200. And among black Americans, it's one in 1,000. If, if they had died of COVID-19 at the same actual rate as white Americans, we would have 20,000 black Americans still alive. 10,000 Latino Americans still alive and 700 indigenous Americans still alive. You probably know how hard COVID has hit the elderly, particularly those living in nursing homes. 7% of the country's cases have occurred in long-term facilities. Deaths related to COVID-19 in these facilities account for 40% of the country's pandemic fatalities. In 18 states, half of the deaths related to COVID are in nursing homes. But you may not know that nursing home cases and deaths are actually driven by racial inequities as well. Nursing homes where there is a high percentage of black or Latino residents account for 60% of those homes hit. Homes where at least seven in 10 residents are black saw a death rate that was about 40% higher than in homes with majority white populations. Overall, by the end of August in the United States, more than half of COVID deaths occurred in people of color. So how has structural racism and social disadvantage led to these disparities? To be clear, in every single way possible. Black and brown communities have higher exposure to virus. They're more often frontline workers who have more risk going to work and fewer options for avoiding exposure without work from home options or sick leave. They have less financial reserve and face greater financial stress in this time and when they miss work. They're less able to stockpile food and other resources. They're more likely to rely on public transportation, more likely to live in crowded and multi-generational households, and less likely to have internet access. And so thus overall, they're less likely to be able to implement some of the non-pharmacologic interventions against COVID like social distancing. There's a higher burden of chronic disease. And of course that itself is due to a host of pre-existing race-based factors woven into our societies and our public health and healthcare systems. They are less likely to be insured, less likely to have access to healthcare centers, uh, particularly well-resourced ones, and they're more likely to face biased care when they do access those healthcare systems. I could go on and on. My point is that sometimes there's a meandering or nuanced connection between racism and social disadvantage and occurrence of disease and deaths. In this case, in the case of COVID, there's a straight and direct and obvious, it's visible from space. And that's why there's no such thing as getting to the end of COVID and then addressing health inequities. Health inequities have to be in the solutions pathway or we will not get on top of it. My second point is about going as far upstream as possible when we intervene. I'll use testing as an illustrative example because it's both addressable and such a huge driver of downstream inequities in COVID. So testing is not happening equitably. This may not surprise you. Um, travel time for testing is higher in communities with high proportions of people of color. Black and Hispanic Americans are more likely to have to endure long wait times to obtain community-based testing because of the high demand in their communities. And data from both New York City and Texas show that more testing is available systematically in communities with a higher proportion of white residents. A study from the California Sutter Health System demonstrated that if you are a black patient and you have COVID, 
you were much less likely to be tested in the ambulatory or outpatient care setting than if you were white. In fact, about half as likely to receive testing in the outpatient or community-based setting than white patients or Asian patients. This means that black patients essentially had delayed testing. They had to be sicker. They had to go into the hospital or get admitted to the hospital or the ICU before testing was made available to them. And what happens when you don't get testing? It means you don't get other types of care. As one example, remdesivir, one of the few pharmacologic therapies that has shown effectiveness against COVID and likely plays a role in shortening the course of the disease, is in short supply globally. And it requires a confirmed positive test and a diagnosis early in the course of disease. In one study of can cancer patients with COVID, black patients were half as likely to receive remdesivir as white patients, which matches exactly the discrepancy that we saw in the Sutter study. Test positivity, positivity is also a condition of enrollment in many clinical trials of COVID. And so the emerging science that we're seeing is less likely to include the populations that need it the most. While there are so many inequities to worry about right now, we need to fix testing and other upstream issues first. My third point is that part of the problem in finding solutions is the incompleteness of the data that we have. It was summer before we had racially disaggregated information about cases and deaths in the majority of states. We still only have racially disaggregated data on testing in six states. Every time we look at disaggregated data, the truth about health inequities gets worse. It never goes in the other direction. And that's why complete data is so necessary. It allows us to understand the scope of the disease. We talk a lot about getting vaccine distribution right, but we will not get it right without understanding where it is needed the most. Our scientific bodies, including the funders who pay for the research and the journals that publish the research finding, are not accustomed to demanding that data submitted to them be disaggregated by basic factors like race or ethnicity. In this pandemic, it is essential for our knowledge base and action plan to have that kind of data. Finally, the inequities in our society reflected in, in employment segregation and leadership segregation are incredibly relevant to our ability to address the current crisis effectively. As of June, only half of black Americans would accept a coronavirus vaccine once available, compared to about 75% of white Americans. That is, of course, due to many factors, including our terrible history of medical experimentation and violation of basic ethics in the treatment of Black Americans. But there's also an element of representation. If you look at the incredibly homogeneous boards of companies like Moderna and AstraZeneca who are rolling out the vaccines, and the research teams at universities across the country dominated by white and Asian physicians and scientists, you will see near zero concordance with the communities who will benefit from the vaccine the most. How can these bodies deliver a trusted message and get the vaccine where it needs to be? As we've already seen in Moderna's phase one trial, there is a neglect of racial or ethnic diversity in, in this research, with only 4% Black and 13% Hispanic participants enrolled. It will be so hard to overcome the lack of deserved trust within our communities of color when it comes to scientific discovery and acceptance of new treatments or engagement in clinical research in this pandemic. And of course, with diverse teams and boards, the science will be better anyway. We're of course not going to fix racism, huge wealth gaps and marginalization of entire populations between now and vaccine distribution or the end of this pandemic. But we can do a few things. We can put resources into hardest hit communities, including communities of color and their trusted leaders at the center of vaccine supply and distribution. We can continue to demand disaggregated data, not just around race and ethnicity, but around disability, age, language, and other factors that will direct us to where we can be most effective in combating disease and protecting our most vulnerable. We can also anticipate that the economic crisis resulting from this pandemic will sharply exacerbate the health crisis already being experienced by Black, Hispanic, Indigenous, and Pacific Islander Americans. There is no question about this. We can't wait to admire the problem as it unfolds. We need to aggressively invest in every way in the health and prosperity of communities of color. It is the public health and societal equivalent of collectively standing at an intersection where we can see in every direction cars speeding towards a person standing in the intersection. And we can run to intervene or we can just stand by and watch it happen and talk afterwards about how it was such a tragedy.
this is not one of those moments where we can say with good conscience, well, I'm not black or Hispanic or indigenous, so I'll be supportive, but this is not my problem. If COVID has taught us anything, it's that all of our fates are bound up in those who are hit the hardest. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone who has, um, who have been involved in this wonderful celebration over the last couple of days. It is a pleasure to be invited and kind of take part in this conversation with all of you that are listening. And uh, greetings from, from uh, the beautiful hills of South Dakota, the Black Hills of South Dakota. Um, these are the lands, the original lands of the Lakota people and other tribes. And I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledge that. Um, I've been working with the Black Hills Center for American Indian Health as a public health scientist for the last, uh, goodness sakes, 20 years <laughs> since graduating from Yale School of Medicine. And I just have to say it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience for me as a Native scientist to actually to do work in our communities. And um, I've been asked to talk about COVID, which all of you are probably very much aware of what is happening in our world today. And um, and I've given this um, discussion or this talk several times to a larger audience over the past couple of months, particularly as it pertains to Indian country, what is happening in our native co communities. But before I go there, I just, want to acknowledge uh, the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health just for all the wonderful things that they've done to me personally. Um, you know, I went there in 19, goodness sakes, 1994, um, was uh, uh, got my master's in public health from there and then on to medical school when I graduated in 2000, not realizing that when I was going through this process that I would be the first American Indian woman to graduate from the School of Medicine, as well as School of Public Health. And that journey, when I do reflect on it, I sometimes go to the negative side because it was so so difficult because my family and I were going through a really difficult time during that process with uh, forced relocation. And it is actually the first time I'm really talking about that time in my life. And I think for me, it's really healing. So now I can really focus on the positive things that have happened to me while I was at Yale. So I just really want to thank everyone who was there during that time to make my journey so smoothly and to make the journey a lot smoother for a lot more um, Native women that are going through the School of Public Health, the School of Medicine, and of course, the college there. So I just want to say thank you. By way of introduction, in our Native culture, it's always important for us to acknowledge our clanships. So I'd like to do that. Uh, and just kind of a traditional greetings to all the Navajo listeners that are out there right now. So COVID, COVID in Indian country, my goodness, um, I think we've been... When I say we, I'm talking about the Navajo Nation. We've been on the forefront of all the news for many, many months. And um, it's just been really disheartening to see what has happened to my own community there. Um, I live in South Dakota and have not been back to Navajo Nation since March. And um, just what the nation has gone through up to this point is, is very disheartening um, up to I think the numbers are, as of yesterday, we have over 10,237 um, cases and over 554, 52 deaths. Um, those numbers may seem a little, if you were, if you weren't from a small community, I mean, if you're like in New York City or wherever, those numbers seem small. But for a nation, a Navajo nation, this this is really high numbers for us. Um, the Navajo Nation prides itself in having one of the largest tribes in America, um, along with the uh, Cherokee Nation. Uh, but we have a reservation, unlike other tribes. We have a large land-based reservation, and um, and we just got hit hard. And there's multiple factors that have been talked widely about that have led to this epidemic. 
in our community, um, including poverty, on, um, poverty, uh, no running water, lack of electricity, or just some of the things that that have really hit our communities. And and we just, you know, when I look at this problem, this epidemic, and I just have to say that our tribal leadership have really stepped forward to to really amend what is happening right now in our communities. And you know, we. We have not had anything like this happen to us in terms of public health epidemic in a very, very long time. And our government actually um, just established for the first time just a couple of years ago, a department of health. So we were a division of health, but not a department of health like the state. So with very little resources, they really move quickly to get things going for the Navajo Nation and in terms of addressing the, the issue at hand. And today, I'm, I'm glad to say that the rates are going down. We just had a flare up just recently, but the rates are going down. So I'm really, really grateful for what is happening there on the nation. And, um, and as we move forward, we really need to kind of think about how we can avoid this from happening again. And I'm sure our, our elected leaders and our public health officials there on Navajo Nation, as well as the states are doing, doing that right now. Just to, probably on Monday of last week, actually, um, the um, Dr. Fauci from NIH actually was um, participated in town hall, town hall meeting with the Navajo Nation, and his urge was to, well, his plea was actually to encourage Navajo people to participate in the clinical trials that are being established throughout the world, and. And I listened to that. I was actually in, uh, with my mom in uh, Wichita by her bedside as we listened to this conversation. And it, I was really, I guess, two things caught my eye. First was the approach that the administration, the Navajo Nation administration did to get approval for this trial. And then secondly is just the, the tone from the Facebook users and predominantly Navajo and what their concerns were in moving forward with this trial. So today's, my, I guess my talk about the, about, um, my talk today is about the clinical trials and its impact on Indian people, our American Indian populations. And I have to preface this by saying that our people actually have participated in multiple trials, clinical trials and vaccine trials for a number of years. And the one notable one is the Pneumovax. So Navajo Nation during this time period in the 1990s and even prior to that high rates of respiratory infection that was caused by pneumo pneumococcal and bacteria and the, the nation went in together with John Hopkins and um, got a trial set up. And I, I'm happy to say that the Navajo Nation was in the forefront um, with with this and um, out of this, of course, now we have Pneumovax, right? Which is really really exciting. So we do have we do have uh, experience in clinical trials, and um, and but moving forward though, as as we move to kind of get this um, to get this vaccine on board on Navajo Nation to get this trial going on Navajo Nation, there's a lot of concerns, and that's one thing that. As a scientist, public health scientist that works with Indian country, I have to really come face to face in what we need to do to make this more effective for our people. And I just want to highlight some things that, as I was preparing for this um, talk, you know, there's several several projects that happen in Indian country that I want to highlight that kind of makes me think are the reasons why our Navajo people and other tribes are a little bit reluctant. Just recently, um, an NIH-funded study, actually it was uh, probably about 10 years ago, um, funded a study with Arizona State, and we called it the, Hav the Havasupai Project, in which this project was supposed to gather DNA, uh, do genetic studies of, of diabetes, uh, diabetes uh, type two in this population. So they collected blood, and unfortunately the I'm not sure exactly who, but the scientists of this t 
team actually decided to use the blood for other different set for another different um, study and and that led to of course lawsuits and everything and most importantly it led to distrust of the people uh, of the native people to participate in trials and and then of course um, I'm not sure if people know about what has happened on Navajo Nation as well as across the country, but, but back in the 1960s and 70s, a law actually was passed to sterilize Native women. Um, they're saying up to about 25% of more of Native women to, particip to participate in a sterilization um, um, I guess it was a, a nationwide sterilization of Native women, and unfortunately, this was this was without their consent. So that just kind of sits at the background of us as clinical as as scientists and trying to deal with this mistrust of the federal government, of of um, scientists, and. And how do we how do we grow from how do we go from here, right? Like, we know this is needed. We know that there are so many benefits to participating in trials, and and how the Navajo Nation, as well as other tribes, can benefit from this. So I did ask some questions, as a scientist would, of several people, including my husband, who's a Lakota scientist. And I asked him, I was like, what what are the benefits for us as Native people to participate in this? in this um, very important public health intervention. Like, what is the importance for it? So I just wanna highlight a few things that he said and others have said, basically so, so that they might uh, do this to, to protect loved ones as well as their household members. It is important that clinical trials represent all races and ethnicities so that the results can be applied to all people. And that COVID-19 has hit Navajo Nation and other tribes the hardest, and that's important for our population to participate in getting, uh, finding solutions for this crisis. And when, when actually, when the quote that was made was someone, he's, she's actually a Yale student who is helping us with our, um, with our, some of our projects, and uh, her name is Emma. So Emma, if you're listening, I really like this um, point that you made so that, so that there's potential if Native people participate in it, that, na that more Native people can um, become scientists and thus encourage, encourage um, others to participate, other Native people to participate in this study. And she thought that was a far stretch, but I wanted to include this. But in addition, I asked the question, why, why would Navajo people and other Native tribes not want to participate in these trials? We, um, as I preface this, you know, by, I guess by the, by, you know, by looking back on our history with the federal government, with scientists, you know, what would, you know, what, what have they done to make our people so mis so distrustful of the process? And, you know, and, and now we move forward. And these are exactly some of the same things that were quoted in that Facebook town hall meeting that Dr. Fauci had with our president, president of the Navajo Nation. And basically it's the potential benefit for the, you know, for, for the participants that they really did not see an opportunity, a true opportunity for themselves and that this was something that was just imposed on them and that there is misinformation about, about their participation. As, as an example, they're, they considered themselves being guinea pigs of this trial. And one of them actually even said like, why, why are they just coming to us now? You know, the, you know, COVID's been in our community since March. So the first case appeared on Navajo Nation March 17th. And it's, it's been what, how many months later, seven, eight months later and NIH and uh, pharma and all these in, you know, other, form, other industries are now coming to us asking us to participate. And I remember I participated in on, the, on a conversation several years, uh, several months ago and I 
I asked a question, you know, and I was talking about COVID in Indian country and particularly Navajo Nation. I asked, I was like, it would be really wonderful as we start talking about vaccine trials to get our tribes involved at the very beginning. I remember this, this specifically saying this. I said, you know, we need to get our traditional healers involved. We need to get our elders involved in this conversation. And I think that is still missing, unfortunately. Now, you know, Pfizer's going to start um, their trial on Navajo Nation very shortly. And, and then, of course, we're involved in it as well as scientists trying to get our elders, um, our community members involved in, in, in a trial that's going to be starting in uh, Cheyenne River. So I think how do we how do we move forward from here? How do we catch up basically billions and billions of dollars have been invested in these trials up to now and probably much more is going to be more invested and how do we move from here and i continue to stress i, I continue to stress the importance of of getting our communities involved even at this stage what can we do to get our traditional healers involved and i think in my work in the tobacco control, I think for me, the only way we made advances in the work that we were that we're doing is to get these individuals involved. And I realized that a lot of Native communities, you know, their traditional healers are not involved as they are as with as with Navajo Nation. But there's other individuals that are that have that clout that can do a lot more or can do as much. So I think for me, just moving forward, and I realize I'm kind of getting close to my closing, but my closing remark is basically get the traditional healers involved. NIH, FDA, CDC, the pharmaceutical companies, other industries, health industries, they have made so much money off of Navajo Nation and other tribes through research. And I really feel as a scientist, a native scientist, that they need to be more present in our communities. You know, um, we push so many of our drugs through Indian Health Service, but yet the benefit other than the health benefit is, is really limited. We don't see jobs, for example, pharmaceutical jobs. I, 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 there's probably only a handful of maybe one or two pharmaceutical companies that have been established in the Indian country. So job opportunities for these individuals is much needed. So I'm kind of thinking more holistic, not just on the health side, but the economic impact that these companies and other industries can have is so important. And then finally, I think it's just, you know, I just said at the beginning, you know, I'm one of probably 10, 15 native scientists in America, public health scientists that is, and we certainly need more of us in, in, um, in this country. Um, so the investment that is needed to, to um, mentor actually young, young, young students at the very, at the very, from the very beginning, all the way through um, graduate school is so, so important. I'm not sure how many Native people have gone through med school since I've graduated, as well as the School of Public Health there at Yale. But I'm hoping that the trend is going up so that we can actually, it's really up to us. You know, we know the language, we know the culture, we know just the in and outs of getting things done on Navajo country, particularly for me, Navajo country as a scientist. And I just, I think that is my plea today um, is just the, increase the investment on Yale's in to, to create more students that will that will go back into our native communities. So with this said, I just want to um, close my uh, talk and uh, look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you.